I'm an editor with Global Voices, which is an international network of writers and translators. Um, we are almost all volunteers, and we work from 130 countries around the world. And to just introduce you to us, I wanted to just show this video. Pull it up here. So just please watch and enjoy, and then we'll talk. But this wasn't this wasn't meant to be a, a place you all donate to Global Voices, but advertising, advertising. Yeah, that's that's what we want to do. Um, so I'll cut that. Let's see. I just want to pull up our homepage here for people to be able to take a look. So Global Voices, um, as I said, we we are a volunteer network. Um, Nearly everybody who writes for us is not doing it because they get paid, but because they are passionate about what they're writing about. Um, we cover all kinds of news, but the thing that kind of distinguishes us as a media organization, if you call us that, is that our sourcing, the sort of big, biggest bed of our sources is the internet itself. So we're typically reporting on events using Twitter, uh, Facebook posts, blogs, um, photographs people have posted on Flickr, other platforms, uh, videos from YouTube to tell stories. And one of the things that is sort of unique about our writers is that they, they usually know kind of the different communities that are really active online in their countries really well. So an example, I actually wanted to pull up, I will search well. Um, I wanted to just show you guys a post. That should be enough. Sorry. God. All right. Well, I'm just going to cut back to this to keep moving. Um, so an example of a kind of Global Voices article that might be really valuable in a way that you wouldn't, you sort of wouldn't get um, this kind of our unique angle from another media organization is, let's say, a protest in Tahrir Square. We've all read about those in lots of different media outlets. Um, the Global Voices post, you'll typically have, uh, for certain, an Egyptian author, somebody who probably was there themselves, um, 
they will write about the situation on the ground and they will pull tweets from different people who came to the protest, groups that might totally disagree with each other. Um, they'll post photos that different people took at the event, maybe video, and then they will give you some context. What do all these different voices that have come together here, kind of what do they mean? How do they relate to each other? How do they relate to sort of the broader political um, situation in the moment? And we think this is uniquely valuable um, at this moment when there is so much being produced on the internet by everybody and so much happening all over the world, uh, particularly when it comes to social movements. It's very difficult to explain social movements when you don't know the context really well. And so this is a value that we feel like um, we have brought to a lot of actually different media spaces. Um, so then I was asked to, to talk about kind of our model and how we, um, how we support ourselves, but then I think that also sort of relates to how we see ourselves in a broader media landscape. We're a volunteer network. We have 1,300 active contributors, which is a ton. Out of that group, we have 12 full-time staff and about 30 part-time paid editors. And then we have, um, we also have, you'll notice up at the top of the screen here that we translate our content and actually create original content in a lot of different languages, 30 actually. Um, I'm just going to the Bahasa page, so that's appropriate. Um, and a number of our translators are paid at cost, so they'll, they'll be paid you know, a rate that they decide, often a dollar a translation. So we have a very light budget. We don't, we're not based anywhere. Um, our staff are, 12 of us live in 10 different countries, and our editors and writers are all over the world. We are funded by a couple of foundations, and we actually have um, some corporate support from Google, and we've had support from Yahoo in the past, um, as well as donor support. But we actually feel like this model is not uh, going to be sustainable for us in the long term. So we've been looking at different ways to kind of change ourselves. And one, apart from crowdfunding and finding different ways to get donations, we've actually also started to think about, well, what's the product that we're creating? Like, we believe that we bring a value and we are really happy that, that it's free most of the time, but are there ways that we could actually start to package our content so that it's worth it to somebody to pay for it. Um, we also have developed a number of media partnerships with and a, a lot of the media organizations that you mentioned in your presentation, um, Al Jazeera, NPR, Deutsche Welle, um, who else? New York Times from time to time, The Guardian, and others. We've actually had partnerships on different specific projects or coverage of a particular country, and those are actually getting to the point where we may be able to start to make that to make that a source of revenue for us. Um, I wanted to just also talk about our um, advocacy project, which is what I work on. The Global Voices community, one thing that's sort of interesting about us is that we're both the kind of reporters on and often protagonists in the stories that we tell. And about five years ago, a number of members of our community started to realize that we've got a huge set of challenges in front of us related to freedom of expression and privacy on the internet. And this it was sort of a very uh, personal thing because a number of members of our community have been uh, threatened, harassed, arrested, imprisoned. Um, people have lived in hiding for long periods of time. And so we decided to actually start a wing of the network that is devoted to these issues of, of human rights um, online. And so that's Global Voices Advocacy, which I've got pulled up here. Um, and this is kind of, I guess, the, what brings us to IGF is that we have realized how much these fundamental rights issues impact all of us as writers, journalists, producers, whatever you want to call us, and we believe we actually can have a, a powerful, hopefully, voice on these issues and, and actually 
sort of engage in policy debates and help shape outcomes in a way that will protect all of us um, as we continue to do our work. Perfect. Thank you, Valerie. I think that uh, this is um, an interesting contribution uh, that stress one of the points that bring us to the next speaker, because um, in the slides of the Sunbrook book, uh, we are, were talking of a declining business model for traditional media, and uh, we are listening that our new media are looking for their business model too, or something that will at least continue to do the work uh, with the same quality and the same passion that we are doing today. So now I turn to Annie Lu, that comes from the World Economic Forum. And uh, you can introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I probably need to switch because I need to run up my I just sit over there. Close to this. Yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Annie Law and I help run the media entertainment and information industry cluster at the World Economic Forum and I'm based in New York. So before I start I just wanted to say that it's really a privilege to be here both at this session and at the IGF. And this particular topic has um, really significance for me both as a professional, uh, at a professional level and a personal level. Before I uh, joined the World Economic Forum, I actually spent six years uh, working as a financial journalist uh, in New York and Asia. So the future of journalism is very much a personal passion as well. So at the World Economic Forum, we um, have the privilege of working with a variety of different stakeholders, including the private sector, civil society, and governments. Um, so as, as we all know, um, digital products and services have become really indispensable to our lives. Um, and the way that we consume news content and other content has really shifted um, forever, uh, in a way, in this hyperconnected world. Since 2011, the World Economic Forum has looked at the future of content and specifically looking at uh, several important themes. One is the evolving interplay between technological innovation and consumer behaviors. And one is the new business models that the incumbent media companies are introducing to cope with and adapt to this shifting digital landscape. And the last one is the role of public policy and how they may play a role in the future business models. So today we're really focused on um, news and journalism industry from a business model perspective, what have worked and what have not, and more importantly, what the future could look like. So some key trends and challenges I have on this slide, and I'll just briefly speak to, to um, all of them. One, the first one is that there is a sentiment amongst media professionals and those who have not worked in the media sector before that everybody is a media company today, uh, enabled by digital technologies, especially social media. So um, content creation is no longer the media sector's um, exclusive domain. Everybody can produce content. And in fact, brand-produced content may eventually surpass ad-supported journalism. Uh, Forbes in the U.S. has just launched a new product called Brand Voices, and it's basically a product which allows brands to sponsor journalism. And it's increasingly blurring the line between, in a way, PR or content marketing and real journalism. But many argue that it could be the savior of quality journalism in the future if professional journalists can make money from content or sponsored journalism and then work on serious quality investigative journalism, then this may be an opportunity for the future. And some of the other trends I think people are very familiar with, news is becoming increasingly commoditized and that's why people don't want to pay for it. And because of social media, citizen journalism, the so-called professional journalists are becoming more and more replaceable. So these are uh, the trends at, at play which very much impact the, the entire ecosystem. Oh, 
So what we have done is that we looked at the cost structure um, of different media companies, and here is the comparison between the New York Times and the Huffington Post. And what I would point out is just the profit margin here. Uh, the Huffington Post ha it has six times the profit margin of the New York Times, making it almost impossible for the New York Times to, to compete, at least on the cost on, on the cost side. And in return, New York Times has done a, a lot, a lot of made a lot of efforts in both managing cost and shifting their existing business model to compete in the digital environment. Environment. But the success has been rather limited, which compounds the challenges facing a lot of um, professional, sorry, a, lo a lot of the legacy media companies. I'm having a bit of trouble with the PowerPoint here. Um, and readers or cons consumers of news media are increasingly unwilling to pay for for news content. We did a survey in six different countries asking people whether they're willing to pay for news on digital platforms. An average 90% people said no, um, absolutely not, or no, probably not. I media companies have pursued a variety of different strategies to, in response to this democratization of content creation. Uh, they have leveraged user-generated content, so the old saying is that if we cannot fight them, we might as well borrow from them. Um, they have also introduced branded content on top UGC and social platforms, such as Twitter, such as um, YouTube. Um, they have also made a bigger push to differentiate by creating higher-end ex exclusive content, which um, citizen journalists or freelance journalists may not be um, or may not have the necessary resources to do. So a, a few case studies that we looked at, and we'll just go through them very quickly. We looked at uh, CNN's iReport initiative, and which has succeeded in driving traffic to CNN.com, but not, has not succeeded in bringing meaningful revenue to, to CNN's bottom line. We also looked at The Economist, which um, in the US at least, or in the Western world, has been hailed as a very successful case study of using blogs and social media to drive ad revenue and to sell subscriptions and in general has been adapting their business model to meet new digital, digital challenges. So um, the, the, the exception is that The Economist is one of the very few uh, successful examples of traditional legacy media companies being able to turn around um, their fortunes using social and, and digital platforms. And, and finally, um, content still matters very much, or brand still matters. So we looked at the big three newspapers, um, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Financial Times, uh, which have had success, successful efforts with using paywalls to get um, new subscribers to, to migrate from print a subscription to digital subscription. And this is sort of a, the, the 2002 comparison of the three big names. And for the, the local newspapers, it's extremely difficult uh, to replicate this model because they do not have the brand recognition and they don't have the wide reach to be able to implement these types of paywall. Looking at the future, a number of issues would have the potential to shape the business models. Um, disruptive technologies, and I think we're, be, we're only scratching the surface here. We're now looking at robotics replacing humans in reporting sports and financial news. Uh, we're, we're also looking at dynamic pricing, so there, there's a mechanism in place now which can um, instantly, in real time, price a piece of content based on both its, its popularity, relevance, and promptness. And we're also looking at talent wars. So for traditional media companies, I think the war is intensifying because they're not, losing, not only losing talent to digital startups and digital media companies, but also losing uh, writers and editors to traditionally non-media companies, such as brands, consumer companies, and even PR agencies. And finally, public policy initiatives, and I think we've heard um, from Jan and from others how in Europe um, there is a concern about the, the decline of quality news and quality news media. And because of the unique role of news media plays in the democratic societies, uh, there will be a lot more public policy attention to how we'll fund um, quality news media in the future. And I think the example that um, Jan gave about the BBC or World Service is a, is a very significant one. If they serve a value, if they have a value proposition, not just for the UK but for the world, then whether UK taxpayers should shoulder the responsibility of funding this operation um, is a very big question. 
So the, the, that last point I wanted to talk about is really uh, looking at the future and the search for sustainable business model will continue. And I think many, many in the news circles and journalism circles have shed many tears on looking for that elusive business model. And it was interesting when Ellery was talking about global voices and how you guys, you know, as a digital native supported news network is still searching for a business model as well. So it's not just a traditional media incumbent problem. And I looked at, um, I, I just went around and I looked at existing um, business models, um, existing nonprofit models. So of course you have the public service models such as BBC and NHK, etc. And you also have newer players such as ProPublica, which was founded by a former Wall Street Journal editor. And it's, um, it's primarily foundation funded, but it's a, it's a digital value proposition, so it's only, it's only existing online. Um, so perhaps the argument could be that for quality journalism, for investigative journalism, not the non-profit model is the way to go because we all know serious news does not sell. Uh, people online want to see cats videos and dogs videos and they're not interested maybe in paying for news on um, <laughs> Egyptian revolution. So that, that is uh, the hard reality that many journalists and news, uh, news media executives are facing. Um, the second model we looked at is a crowdfunding model and it's getting a lot of traction uh, recently. And I think Giacomo was with us at a meeting where we explored uh, Kickstarter and crowdfunding platforms and how they may possibly play a role in funding or providing capital for quality journalism and investigative journalism. And if you go to Kickstarter, you c this is one of the world's only maybe the world's largest crowdfunding platform, uh, they published a list of the 10 most funded journalism projects of 2013. And uh, a, a radio station, an online radio station called 99% Invisible is entirely funded by on Kickstarter. And it's now a, a rather sizable operation. So this can be done. But it's probably difficult to scale purely based on crowd on a crowdfunding model. So it, it, it probably wouldn't solve all of our problems here. And the last one, uh, it's a bit tongue in cheek because um, as we all know, Jeff Bezos from uh, Amazon recently purchased the Washington Post. So the, the joke in Silicon Valley is that technology and technology billionaires can probably save everything. So uh, perhaps more people like Jeff Bezos would buy newspapers or buy newspapers like uh, the Washington Post and just subsidize them. Uh, but is this the model that we want if we want to uphold pluralism, diversity of, of news and journalism? And, and there are other technologies which are emerging which could potentially um, either disrupt or maybe save um, quality journalism. One is uh, what, I, what I talked about earlier, um, robotic reporting. By Narrative Science is a company uh, that produces a technology which would enable uh, automated aggregation, synthesis, and creation of content of news content purely from data. So um, the whole concept about using data to produce news is, is very real and it's potentially um, going to eliminate a lot of jobs but, but create, a, create many new ones. So perhaps the role of journalists in the future is not to report on financial earnings or uh, baseball scores but really to curate and analyze and investigate. And lastly, I want to talk about uh, BuzzFeed which I don't know um, if any of you have used it. It's, it's very popular in the U.S. and I think in Europe as well. Um, so BuzzFeed started out really as a, a, a website for listicles. Listicles are basically not necessarily articles, but they're lists like 25 things you wish you did on Christmas but didn't, or the, the cutest cat videos online, etc. So BuzzFeed is, I think, five years old. They were based on an algorithm technology developed by a graduate from MIT to figure out what type of content is the most it could most likely go viral. And and based on that, they have developed a very um, now profitable company. And what's happening now is that they made their money from non-quality journalism, or arguably probably not journalism, but listicles. But as, as, as they're making money through cat videos and dogs videos, and they're now investing seriously in opening foreign bureaus, and they have, I think, opened 20 international bureaus, and they're now producing, I, I, in my view, um, quality news articles and journalism on politics, on economics, and finance. So, 
the argument can be made that th these two can exist. You can, you journalists can create content, uh, sponsored or brand journalism, but then they may be able to, to subsidize um, investigative or serious journalism using revenue from the other side of the business. So, I mean, the, the, the conclusion here is that nobody has found that elusive sustainable business model yet, otherwise we wouldn't be here discussing this. Um, but there are a lot of, I would say, I mean, there are a lot of challenges facing this industry, uh, but also a lot of exciting opportunities both enabled by technology and by new consumer behaviors awaiting us. So, so the future is not necessarily bleak. Thank you very much, Arnie. My main concern is how I have to call my robotic uh, neighbor in the, in the office in the newsroom. Uh, is, is a journalist or not? I don't know. Uh, and probably will not be part of the union, for sure. Uh, can I turn now to Google? We are, uh, you have also a presentation, so you have to leave the computer to him. So, Mr. Yamaguchi is responsible of policy for Google in Japan, uh, but uh, he accepted to participate and to give us some hints about uh, what Google can do. So, probably after Bezos, also Google could be buying some newspapers with difficulties, economic difficulties. You can announce about that? <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> um, Thank you, um, everybody, and distinguished panelists and audiences. Thank you all uh, to have Google in this session. My name is Takuya Yamaguchi, Public Policy Manager at Google Japan. My main, my main specialty is innovation policy, so freedom and expression is not out close a bit, but uh, let me try. Uh, as one of the global leading internet company, um, uh, supporting freedom of expression is one of the indispensable elements of Google activities all around the world. I'd like to talk a little bit about the proposed topics by Giacomo, and such as our thoughts on how the web journalism 2.0 may look like, and some activities to support that. Um, as all our participants here know, uh, we are living in a very unique time, the age of the internet. The world is literally the most powerful communication tool in the history, and uh, history of the world. Up until the internet, every form of journalism was run by the rich or the influential. A few newspaper television stations owned the exclusive right to uh, distribute news. The internet changed all that, empowering everyone anywhere to have their say. The internet provides people with the ability to limit borders, to disregard the conventions. No, I, I don't mean this in IGF, but <laughs> and to engage in a precedented debate on everything. Blogs, social networks, and other video platforms are now widely available for everyone with access to the internet. In 2010, blogger users published more than half a billion blog posts and wrote more than 250,000 words a minute, which is, let's say, almost 5,000 new novels a day. As of May 2013, more than 100 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. A 37% increase over the last six months and 100% over last year. Um, in this uh, circumstances, what web journalism 2.0 look like? Uh, here's some idea. Um, one, journalism will be more open form, no need to care constraint space, and most likely free form. It's almost like a, you know snacks rather than a formal dinner on the table, and um, can be consumed more casually. And secondly, the journalism will be more open-ended, can be published as soon as possible, and can be extended or corrected on the fly. The third, um, journalism will be more open-minded. Again, journalism become more open-ended, more variety of aspects on the news can be delivered rather easier way which supports pluralism as well. And fourth, um, journalism will be increasingly open sourced. Everyone can be a journalist to some extent. I don't mean professional journalists can be altered by amateurs, but you can be a journalist just with a digital camera or videos in Stanford, right? and they can stay um, just one click using public or available medias. I personally agree that the reliability of the news source is at least to some extent. But um, really more providing a the source for them will be the way. Um, fifth, uh, news, news 
will become more personalized. Uh, people tend to search and select their interest in area, just for politics, on uh, economies, on entertainment, or more specific areas they want. And, and lastly, um, news will not go without the social layers. On top of the news article provided, people can put on additional information and exchange personal knowledge and experiences on top of the provided news. So people tend to make sure if the source is not biased using such social networking services. So I think um, uh, these changes will make uh, internet as a campaign tool and to empower journalist citizens. The web's large scale of reach makes it an attractive media for political information, connecting with others and action. It empowers citizens to become more knowledgeable. Um, equip them with um, information and enables them to organize, form networks, and gather strengths, such as to secure human rights. You know, examples such as Egyptian Revolution in 2011, and uh, Occupy Movement in the U.S., and so on, so on. So, uh, what could we provide? Uh, uh, what is Google providing to support such movement to facilitate or enable web journalism 2.0? Um, let me present to you briefly about uh, our activity to support web journalists. What is um, Google Media Tools? We recently prepared a site for the journalists presenting available and powerful tools at Google for gathering and organizing news, uh, engaging, visualizing, and publishing it on the, e on the Internet. In addition, journalists can be supported financially using such services like as function we provide. And for the students, we do uh, some kind of Google Journalist Fellowship, and we also sponsor the ONA Google Student Newsroom, which takes place at the premier conference for, uh, focused on the digital future of the industry. In European countries, we partner with the Global Editors Network on a series of Editors Lab events, a hackathon, and the Global Data Journalism Award. We also founded a Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism report on the impact of the Internet on journalism. In Canada, uh, we sponsored a Journalist for Human Rights and the Canadian Journalist for Free Expression and hosted a newsroom training for more than 75 journalists. In Brazil, uh, we sponsored the Brazilian Investigative Journalism Association and for the Global Investigative Journalism Conference to be held in Rio de Janeiro this month. In Australia, we will soon announce that we are the major supporters of the journalism innovation grants by the Walkley Foundation in Australia. And we also provide uh, training sessions. We provide workshops and one-on-ones to newsrooms and journalists around the globe. To date, in the media team has trained over 2,000 journalists from around the world. So uh, you may be, um, have read the latest news that we have just announced uh, the several tools available under Google Ideas project for supporting freedom of expression and journalism. Some of those are not Google products yet, but we continue to cooperate uh, or support such activities to pro project, uh, protect journalism and to provide more transparency for the journalists. And so my last word is, is Google is um, um, surely committed to support freedom of expression and to maintain pluralism in the journalism models and provide powerful tools and platforms to both for the professionals and the citizens. So let's keep the net free and open as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, not scoop. You don't buy any newspaper, but you simply subsidize some activities in various parts of the world, including Global Voices, sure. yeah? Thanks. They have to increase the subsidy? Of Google? <laughs> it varies. We've had different grants at different times, so. so you're with that. Oh, you want to make a request now? You, no, you no, no. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> no. Okay, so I, um, this was the second round of panelists, and now there is the last one. Um, but if you have any urgent question, as I said before, no? So, can I ask you to join the audience and to the last speaker, that is Guy, one is already here, to, if you want to stay, you can, eh? I'm interested. Okay, perfect, for the final round of question. Okay, um, so, uh, I see Anna that's uh, laughing. Uh, you remember our conversation about how we change the, the approach to journalistic? Yes, this is what, what, what we are talking about. 
um, Guy Berger. He was silent because he was taking notes because he has to make the report about all this um, we are saying today, but probably you have also your viewpoint on that as UNESCO. Well, I, I, I was tweeting, so that was a way of taking notes and sharing my notes with uh, people who are not in the session. <laughs> so, shall I go ahead? Uh, thank you. I, I was asked to speak about journalist safety because, of course, the, the whole thing about journalism being independent journalism and sustainable journalism and business models for journalism and open journalism depends on journalists being safe. And, uh, of course, not everybody wants to see journalists being safe. Robots needs also protection? Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, rob robots can be uh, victims of, uh, of attacks and start generating false information, I'm sure. Okay, who's a journalist today? I thought I would share this with you because this is part of the, the discussion so far. And interesting, the UN Human Rights Committee, which is not the same as the UN Human Rights Council, but it, it's, it's related to it, they say it's important that you, you focus not on who is the journalist so much as what is journalism. So you look at the function. And then if you start looking at the function, of course you start uh, seeing who's there. And, and that's more or less what uh, people would say is the most important thing from, the, from a societal point of view and from a, a user point of view. At UNESCO, where I work, uh, we use journalists in quite a broad sense usually. Uh, it includes your typical journalists, uh, but we also use that term to include um, freelance journalists uh, as well, and uh, also media workers, you know, fixers, drivers, people who are assisting journalists in, in conflict zones, for example. Uh, and social media producers, not all social media producers, because not everybody who goes on Facebook is doing journalism. We talk about those who are doing significant amounts of public interest journalism. So uh, I think this is important because, of course, freedom of expression is everybody's right. But uh, from a societal point of view, one is particularly interested in those contributing to journalism, because public news is different to personal news in terms of its, uh, its overall value. So I think it's important to say, well, what is safety? Because we talk about safety and it's actually quite complicated. It covers quite a lot of issues. Um, as I've said, safety should be the right of everybody, uh, that you should feel safe to speak, that there should not be adverse repercussions. Uh, but as I've also said, particularly for those who are doing journalism, which is often, it's, it's because it's a public act, it becomes far more uh, 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 potentially dangerous. So safety ranges from what's in place in terms of preventing you uh, from experiencing dangers as a journalist or contributing to journalism, what will protect you and what will preempt things, and the combating of impunity. One of the biggest problems, of course, with the, the attacks on journalists is that those who commit crimes of, uh, against freedom of expression are not brought to book and this just emboldens uh, them to continue. Uh, part of safety, therefore, is to promote a social culture at large which cherishes freedom of expression and, and press freedom in particular. Uh, we still like to use the term press, press freedom not because it's only for newspapers, but uh, we think press freedom is more fundamental than media freedom. Anyway, I, I can come back to that if need be. Uh, of course, so safety then is related to laws and how they're implemented. It relates to what institutions there are in the states that should be protecting or uh, following up um, uh, cases of killings of journalists, it relates to um, the capacities of journalists themselves, it relates to the overall culture. And of course what's very relevant to this is that safety is online and offline and very importantly the interaction between these two realms. It's, you can't only speak about safety in one area and not in the other and, and I'll give you one example of that uh, shortly. Cyber safety, I won't go into this because there's a, there's a whole discussion, a whole session that's going to happen about this tomorrow morning. But you can see from this list here that uh, you know, there's, there, there are a lot of particular threats to safety uh, specific to what happens in, in, in doing journalism in cyberspace. Uh, the, the most interesting thing I think also is that because of cyberspace, a lot of those threats can, they do leave a trail also. So just as journalists may leave a trail, a digital footprint that can endanger them, people who attack journalists using uh, electronic methods can also sometimes be traced. So it's an interesting arena. Well, to come to specifically what the UN is doing with journalist safety and now with this new era of who is a journalist and what is journalism, uh, what, uh, the group I work for, UNESCO, so 
the constitution of UNESCO coming out of the Second World War is to promote the free flow of ideas because this is thought to be um, necessary to prevent the kind of indoctrination that happened uh, that allowed Nazi Germany to mobilize its whole population, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for the war. So free flow of ideas is for, for peace. So uh, a lot of work has been done since 1997 in the name of the international community, 195 member states, c killings of journalists are condemned. Uh, member states are asked to report on what they're doing about these killings. Uh, they still don't all report, uh, but it is increasing the number, and those who do report don't always report great success. So there's still work to be done there. Uh, there are annual reports that are give, get given to uh, UNESCO bodies, and there's a, a UNESCO work plan on safety, specifically endorsed by, by the um, UNESCO member states executive board. Um, now what's interesting is UNESCO is of course not the only part of the UN that's concerned about this because the other ones, particularly the UN Human Rights Council, which is a bit different to the Human Rights Committee, but they uh, have started taking up this issue more and uh, more. And more. I, I mentioned here this uh, important resolution last year supported by Austria. You'll hear more about that. Um, we also have the Security Council condemning attacks against journalists in conflict situations. So this is all part of trying to create a culture in which uh, you know, journalists shouldn't be attacked. Special rapporteurs are particularly significant. But clearly you need a lot more than what is UNESCO doing, what the Human Rights Council is doing, Security Council and the Special Rapporteurs. So the idea came about of trying to pull in the entire UN, that is UNICEF, the International Labour Organization, uh, UN Drugs and Crime, UN Women, and so on, to say, can they all get involved in this cause? So uh, UNESCO convened this founding conference in September 2011 to say to the whole UN, let's really put more muscle into this thing. And fortunately, the chief executives of all the UN bodies then agreed to a plan that came out of this, this conference in 2011. And I think this is important to say now, the philosophy of the plan is that um, this shouldn't be altruism on the part of UN organizations, they have a particular mandate, but their mandate is very much affected by the safety of journalists. Uh, many of them work directly with journalists. They need journalists to be safe to do their work. The, the World Bank trains journalists how to report corruption. If those journalists are being killed or are too scared to report on corruption, the World Bank is, is wasting its money. So the point is no UN body or even the UN as a whole could single-handedly deliver on safety for people who are doing journalism. So the whole plan implies that there should be multiple partnerships within the UN, UN and governments, regional bodies such as Council of Europe, uh, media actors and the civil society. And I won't go into detail here except to, see that you, to tell you that in this plan it targets different areas. It says in the UN itself you need more effective communication, coordination, action, sharing responses. Uh, member states also need to Im improve their act in terms of dealing with this issue. Partnerships is a whole other part of it, particularly partnerships with the media, civil society, uh, general awareness raising and fostering safety initiatives like sharing best practices. For example, Colombia used to be as troubled as Mexico with the number of killings of journalists, their experience in stabilizing that situation is something that uh, is a safety initiative that can be fostered. So to walk the talk, because of course you know, this is just nice words that the UN is going to get involved, there was a step further to develop an implementation strategy with a lot of, implement, lot of input. Uh, this was in Vienna in, Aust in Austria uh, last year. And coming out of that, quite concrete actions were, 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 were proposed. So it's not just lines of actions, now specific actions. And part of these are now the responsibility of particular actors. And the idea is that each actor in its particular environment can do something there. So particularly this plan of action is looking at some of the most troubled countries, South Sudan, Iraq, Pakistan, Nepal. And in those countries there's been a national approach to bring together, for the first time in most cases, governments, UN, civil society, journalists, freelancers, uh, 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 police. Um, so, you know, it, it's really a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, there's also now, and I'll come to the most important part of this presentation, is in order to see if you're making a difference with this UN plan and its big ambitions to you know, mobilize society, 
you need a baseline to say, okay, we started this now a year later. Did you make a difference? Because it's very complex, um, this thing. So there are set indicators that have been developed. And besides for being implemented in these first phase, first phase countries, three Latin American countries will also start doing these indicators. So this is what I'll tell you about the indicators, because the indicators are trying to say, how do you assess what is the level of safety in a society? So the general indicators of course, how many journalists are killed, threatened, uh, how, many are brought to, how many of the attackers are brought to book, how much collaboration is there, how many joint events are there, joint statements are there, and so on, for the whole society. Then with the UN, is the UN really monitoring this problem? Is it coordinating amongst itself? Is it training, whether tra it's training prosecutors or training journalists? Is it promoting the normative view that it's unacceptable to attack a journalist? State institutions, you can see the, the kind of indicators we look there. That includes also indicators are the political actors, the political parties taking a stand on this issue. When a journalist is killed, does the government speak out and condemn this? So these are the indicators that we start measuring and we hope after a year, after two years, we can see improvement to that. Civil society organizations and academia, again, they have uh, uh, what's the state of play in those areas. And now we come to interesting things um, for for this uh, session and the IGF, media organizations, those are the, the, the companies themselves, the unions and the associations, the actual practitioners, and the, and the coverage of safety. Because unfortunately the media itself is, is very um, short-term orientated in this coverage of safety. There's poor follow-up of safety stories. So in these indicators, it says that all media actors should be promoting safety in digital communications. So the sub-indicators here, are journalists aware of digital dangers and how to protect themselves? Um, are journalists effectively using the protection? Um, are there opportunities and are those being taken up for journalists to learn about encryption? And are employers and others providing the kind of backup that's needed for journalists to practice digital safety. Then we come to intermediaries like um, Google. <laughs> Not to single out Google at all, but uh, what I mean is the search engines, the social networks, all these uh, uh, domain name registries and so on, they all have an increasing potential to play a role in safety. Um, so part of the indicators is to say, do the intermediaries respect journalism safety? So, for example, do they have secure facilities that protect journalist data from hackers? Um, do they have clear and transparent and proportionate policies about releasing private data to enforcement authorities? We're also looking at do they report periodically on these questions? Uh, do they have data protection policies that entitle the clients to access what data is, is there about them and to track third party engagement with their data? So I'm going to wind up now, uh, Giacomo, um, to make this thing a bit more real. The World Press Freedom Day every year, uh, UNESCO organizes it. More than 100 countries are having events. These are some of the tweets this year. Um, people raised at uh, the World Press Freedom, one of the World Press Freedom Day conferences that the anti-press freedom actors are becoming increasingly skilled and are digitally posing as journalists to try and uh, besmirch journalists um, to uh, um, get uh, sources to, to betray their, their, their identities and so on. This was another tweet that came out said anybody can be tracked and attacked. The net is not anonymous. Digital, digi digital risks can become physical threats, which indeed has happened in Mexico. Corporate responsibility, the UN Special uh, Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Frank LaRue, he said Corporate responsibility should be not selling surveillance software to states that repress people for exciting free speech. Um, these are some tweets were done around, uh, some cartoons done around World Press Freedom Day, which I think kind of makes the point about safety. And, and so one of the speakers at a World, a World Press Freedom Day event, she said that uh, citizen journalists and bloggers are particularly vulnerable in Mexico. They need training. Only two Mexican papers have been brave enough to publish and follow up journalism with killings. Social media is becoming an outlet. But she said social media also shows that it's not only the best source of information on violence, but four producers were killed, two were decapitated. And here's one of the difficulties. You as a journalist may not put information on Facebook 
about what you are doing or where you're going, but your, your friends and your cousins and your family might put that stuff online. So it's extremely complex. Uh, the last tweet here is that uh, if you think you've got nothing to hide online, it doesn't mean that you, your networks, are not of interest to somebody now or someday. So, of course, for sources of journalists, this is a, a key thing. So that's it. Um, there's more information about the, uh, the UN Plan of Action on the UNESCO website. You can just search it or you can look at that address there. And ultimately, the, the safety of journalists is a barometer of if it's safe for society to speak and for society to use social media, particularly if it's doing it uh, in, in, a, in a public way with public interest content. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very exhaustive um, representation of the, what the UN Action Plan means and the concrete uh, consequence on that on the daily work of journalists. Uh, Matthias. Can I ask you to present the Austrian initiative and saying other things? Matthias, you represent the, uh, the Austrian government. Yes, uh, my name is Matthias. I'm from Austria, Vienna. I work for the Austrian government in the Federal Chancellery. And I'm here also uh, to explain to you what the Council of Europe especially is doing in the context. Uh, I, 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 I thought Giacomo would say to me, uh, Matthias, may I ask you to be very brief now because time is running out. Uh, you didn't say so because you're such a polite moderator, but I will be brief in any way. Um, I was thinking when we had the first part in this uh, session today, how will I uh, then uh, really uh, turn the corner from the business models to the safety of journalists and so on, but thanks to uh, to, to Guy, it was already done. Uh, nonetheless, I want to speak very briefly because both are Council of Europe topics, both on the safety aspect, but also on the question of the media actors, as we call them, who are not, let's say, these traditional journalists. Very, very briefly. Um, as it was already mentioned, not only my government, but uh, UNESCO, of course, and the Council of Europe um, have a, as a priority topic, a political priority topic, the safety of journalists and other media actors. Um, Europe uh, is absolutely not a field where journalists can be can feel safe. Uh, also in Europe, uh, journalists are intimidated, uh, harassed, are deprived of their liberty, physically attacked, and much more. When I speak of uh, Europe, I speak uh, of the 47 member states of the Council um, of Europe. Um, what has happened was that apart from the Austrian initiative in the UN Human Rights uh, Council, <clears throat> also in the Council uh, of Europe, um, we are now, because the Austrian presidency will start in the Committee of Ministers in uh, 13 November 2013, so very soon, we will also uh, continue to go on um, with this topic. Uh, well, what do we see as really uh, the big, big challenges? It's the question of impunity. So uh, I don't know how much you're aware with, with this term, but impunity means really the state, maybe he does not intervene in freedom of expression, or at least in, he claims not to intervene. So he says, well, do what you want. But impunity means that when there are attacks on journalists, be it by the police, but be it also by privates, there is no reaction of the state. So uh, this is there, and all the research where it shows it, one of the biggest problems worldwide, that there is not enough uh, work done by states, be it on the legal side, but be it also on the non-legal side, being in maybe also the education of people and the importance of the freedom of the press and so on. So impunity is one of the central topics and the Council of Europe is also very much of course based to work on, because it's part of the Council of Europe, on the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights especially speaks about the positive obligation the state has to protect journalists. And 
we found also in a special steering committee, the CDMSI and the Council of Europe, that what does this obligation really mean, this positive obligation, is one of the central focus we must also have in future. That you can uh, just have an idea what, what is meant by this positive obligation. It's, for example, of course, the state has to create uh, real protection for the sources of journalism, uh, so that they do not have to disclose uh, their, their uh, information sources and so on. Um, but there is much more in the positive um, obligations field because um, the court um, literally says that uh, the states have the duty uh, to create a favorable environment um, for journalists and the women, but also for participation in public um, debate for all persons. And this does not happen in many cases. I spoke about the intimidation, now I come to back to those who, who are the persons concerned. On the one hand, of course, the classic journalists and the media and so on, and that's why it's so important, of course, to, that also EBU, for example, is having a look at this and says, well, uh, our fellow journalists in the world are really uh, under big, big danger. But it's, to my mind, also, um, Therefore, I'm very grateful also how this um, discussion here is, it was prepared and is going on and what UNESCO is doing, what the Council of Europe is doing. We must really have a more intensive debate uh, on the role of the bloggers of, let's say, just people who really bring contributions to public debate. The problem is, to my mind, that politicians, that governments, are very reluctant still in many parts of the world to speak about the non-professional journalists, but about those who shape public opinion. Without those people, for example, the Arab Spring wouldn't have happened in that uh, special way uh, for the benefit of some, not for the benefit of others. But I think the, the topic really um, to include those uh, who are really shaping public opinion and who are not journalists but are media actors is one of the big, big tasks also of IGF still. Bloggers should be sure that their ideas um, who to, to really participate and not to be, uh, let's say, um, shut uh, up in their opinion by governments find a place here also in IGF and we should talk about the incidents um, that are happening. Um, last point, I want to say it will be very interesting how the European Court on Human Rights um, will continue to deal with this question of um, persons shaping public opinion because um, you may have heard or may, you may be even aware or maybe even you are aware <laughs> Uh, that, of course, uh, there are very, very uh, strict and there is li very little space for uh, states when it comes to restrictions of people who are shaping public debate, be it politicians, be it journalists, and so on. And I think all the discussion, who is a journalist, who is a media actor, um, can be based on much of the um, Cord has already said, because he looks very concrete in the concrete situation. Who is the author of, is it for example a blogger who just blogs normally, today the weather is fine, today it's hot, or I hate going to this or this shop, or is it maybe a blogger who has meanwhile uh, taken part in public debate for a long, uh, a long time, and uh, the people are expecting also something from him. So. It, it is very, will depend very much on the author and also on the public expectation. So I see a big task also for the future of IGF, for the future of our common work here in the multi-stakeholder approach, to have an in-depth look of the situation of um, journalists on the one hand, on the text journalists, but also on um, other media actors. and. Uh, Council of Europe, to just underline this, uh, will continue 
um, to be a solid uh, and reliable uh, basis for discussions uh, as regards the protection of journalists, but also the development of media freedom. And we all invite you really to uh, cooperate with Council of Europe, although it's an intergovernmental organization um, for several years. Meanwhile, um, the 47 member states have said we are ready for the multi-stakeholder approach and uh, we do standard setting and so on um, in close connection with non-state actors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. So, if I understand, one of the solutions could be like on eBay to put a, a sort of a reputation of the seller of the information. Yeah. Uh, that's an uh, interesting model to discuss, and we probably could bring some ideas for the next IGF. Okay, um, we are at the end of the panelist um, uh, presentation. Because there are people that are still with us in the room, I think that we deserve them to <laughs> give the rights to have some questions. Very short, because unfortunately we lost 20 minutes at the beginning of the session for technical reasons, but this is the life. Can we have a mic over there? Uh, I'll be happy to cover it without a mic. So very quickly, is, you know... Uh, the transcript. Uh, thank you. Very quickly, this is for the gentleman from the UN. Uh, you mentioned about, you know, d digital footprints are perpetually online. And one of the things that we've been raising at the ITU is the right to be forgotten. Uh, so how do we intend to address that? Because no government and not even many of our own companies like Google is here or Facebook, how does a company implement or uh, can governments make policy for the right to be forgotten? Your views on that. You know, it, it, I think it depends to some extent what you mean uh, uh, when you say right to be forgotten. What uh, I, I, I don't mean you personally, because it just there are different uh, interpretations about. Uh, is it a form of, of the right to privacy and how extensive is it and is it a time-based right? Is it a, uh, and then what, uh, if it's a subsection of privacy, what constitutes a violation of it? Um, so so it's, it's a complex issue. Uh, um, I think it's still early days. This, and I know in uh, Europe, the European Commission, I think, was recently debating this, uh, uh, this very issue. But it's something that I think the UN system hasn't yet come to grips with uh, as, as a debate. Well, as a complement of information, the Association of the uh, Privacy Guarantors in Europe is investigating on that. And they have opened already um, some proceedings in various countries. So I think that there will be some, some developments, at least in Europe. Then the problem is how to make this applicable uh, in other parts of the world, so, and even in Europe. Google have a view on that? No? Okay. We just, maybe we just can add that within the European Union, you have, you may be certainly aware of that the data protection framework as such is now under a complete new review, and especially also there, as regards the um, new regulation, and so the right to be forgotten is one of the questions. Because data protection, people often tell you, explain to you, um, you have it all already. You have it already in the data framework, because, for example, the right to delete or so. But it's not that what you gentlemen, I think, are talking of, we, if we need more. That is also in the Internet Governance Strategy of the Council of Europe. One of the topics when we also talk about users' rights, we'll come back to that tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, I want to invite you for that. We'll speak about users' rights and the work of the Council of Europe. Uh, we'll come back to that and maybe you can also join this workshop and ask again about this question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other brave person that want to make a question? Okay. I think it gets cold and colder at least here. Yeah. So there's, there's a way to sorry, us to, to, to leave the room. There's a way to push out of the room. 
So thank you everybody for participating and attending this debate. I think that was interesting and uh, I think that we have an interesting reflection to make. And Guy has all he needs for making his report tomorrow. Uh, thank you. If anybody, uh, I'm sure, wishes to discuss further with the panelists, please uh, buttonhole us because uh, I, I'm sure all of us would appreciate some, some feedback. So tell us. Thank you. Okay. And if you can give the a web address of where we can see the story that you were telling before uh, could be useful and we will put in the report as an, as an example. Thank you very much. <laughs>